and it's wonderful that there are all these ways to express yourself and make shit and make yourself keep yourself like creatively satisfied and do shit that resonates with people that affects people like it's it, it's a world it's now where say that. everyone's yeah. a creator everyone everyone creates shit it's whether your shit is dope and whether it gets seen you need the Kellervision app 24 7 mini documentaries podcasts live shows dj live streams top fives subscription packages plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports download it from the app store for free today THTC, the UK's leading ethical streetwear label. Organically grown and ethically built garments from hemp, organic cotton and other sustainable materials. 2019 is their 20th anniversary year. Join me with THTC as a Killer Keller podcast sponsor celebrating music, social activism, hemp and street culture. THTC, eco-fashion redefined since 1999. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we're here to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, or as central as you should be, could be, or want to be, uh, due to uh, um, an unwell- overwhelming uh, situation called COVID. We are doing Zoom again, which we love. Big shout out to Graffiti Kings inside the house. Um, without a doubt, the next guest inside the ride for this week um long standing mate of mine uh, and we go back like a, a carriage clock to say the least from the secret layer um bdhq bd man how are we brother i am trapped in my house <laughs> located nuts. where whereabouts are you in this hidden hidden fortress of, of greenery i'm not giving you my coordinates in case you call <laughs> in a drone strike i know your mates with the government and shit this is all a ruse it's a cia <laughs> operation man this whole thing's a sting i know what you're up to man you don't fool me <laughs> covert covid c- c- hideouts you covert know I mean? covid hideout thing yeah, that's right. Um, how how is how are things uh, in general? How are you, brother? You good? Uh, I resent that question and I refuse to answer it. <laughs> oh God, no, this is a podcast. Yeah, God no, damn no. It. Listen, it's twenty twenty. It's not. It's not polite to ask someone how they are in twenty twenty because the only answer is, um, you know. So I'm, I'm I can tell you. I can tell you. Uh, I can tell you what I like. I like. I like making music and. Um, 2020 is a good time to make music because there's fuck all else to do <laughs> dude i'm telling you oh. man like i think we had a kind of we had a, a spurt at the start of uh, g- you know setting our shit up where we were chatting and and it's it's a whole new world of technology and as we all know for anybody that's uh, fans of beardy outside of his uh, vocal elasticity he does have more gear for a 2020 year you've been collecting you know your tech for inside out it must be weird to you to think that's this has become the norm for a lot of people now yeah it's important if you're a musician now to get like a green screen studio otherwise you won't have a way to put yourself out there like you can sell music but who's buying music in 2020 you're just turning on the music tap and listening to the stream and and artists don't get yeah. remunerated for that unless you're one of the labels and you've got all this catalogue and then you get, you know, all that, that 0.001 of a penny per stream then adds up, you know. Yeah. And so, yeah, you, you can do Bandcamp, but you're going to struggle to make a living on that. You can do merch, but again, that can mainly just be a side hustle. But like mm. most people are now realizing that if you want to get a career in music that is going to be financially remunerative, you're going to need to do streaming and mm. then get people to subscribe to some kind of monthly payment model on coffee or you know kofi is it kofi or coffee who knows uh, oh, yeah. or patreon or twitch or any of these things so like yeah the onus is on every single musician out there performer of any kind seeing as public uh meetups are banned effectively yeah. and might be for yeah. maybe another year maybe more maybe less who maybe knows longer, yeah. who knows so like yeah you have to get a fucking green screen studio so you can make your shit look, in- look interesting you got to make sure you've got cameras pointed at you luckily you've got computers now which are fast enough to do mm-hmm. that but that's what everyone has to do it's mad 
it's it's madness. In fact, the last thing you're actually doing often is making music because you're configuring, figuring out, and <laughs> moving heads to different heads where you've got to be. Suddenly, you've got to be like a publicist or a marketer or a oh, computer right. analyst. Well, that was hey, true before this, before this COVID. True. Thing. Yeah, you had true. to be like if you wanted to be in music, you had to be your own publicist and, and and marketing consultant. You had to know how that wears me down. That you have to keep abreast of how all these different platforms work because I don't like them all. I don't like Instagram at all. Facebook is this mm. d- detestable, uh, just roiling pit of, of filth and shock and, and, and rumor and, and like, you know, quick fix yeah, yeah. endorphin but hits. It's like, it's like survival of the fittest, isn't it? And if you don't fall in line and go where the market is... Oh, you have then, to. Otherwise, you don't exist. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I mean, you can make music for yourself that no one else ever hears, but... What's the point of that, you know? So you yeah, got yeah, yeah you got to know. But that's, that's always been true of any any band though, like any band that like like Radiohead for example, like they've always been very canny with knowing how to directly make their yeah. art and then get it to people. So like but they've always been good at playing the game. So like they've got all their own in-house art team, which is basically like the one guy that Tom York knew from when he was in university, just keep it all in-house. Like when they that's got, sick. They I got, love that. They got success off of Creep. We're talking like 1993 for any of the younger listeners. Radiohead are a band when bands were a thing. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 Drums, they, guitar. Yeah, yeah, remember that shit? No, they had to like... Um, I mean, they, they got famous off of Creep, which was their one like uh, big woe is me grungy single. And then they were like, no, we need to like take all of this in-house. So they just went punk and they were like, okay, we're going to buy all our own, our own equipment. We're not going to rent out expensive studios. We'll get our own van and all this kind of shit, which is like... If you're a band getting successful and there's a big record company behind them, which there was for them, you don't have to do that. You can just mm. go with their recommendations and you spend tens of thousands of pounds just spunking it on all these expensive producers and production That's studios right. and shit. And you just rent a tour bus and all this bollocks. But they were like, no, fuck it. We're going to own the means of production and go punk and you know just did it all themselves yeah. as much as they could. And then when it came to marketing in the early days of the internet, they were using that as much as possible. Um, and then as soon as it was possible to do so in like 2008, they were out of there. Um, I'm a bit of a Radiohead nerd, as you might be able to tell. But no, like, this is good. But like they, <laughs> they abandoned the idea of having a, a record contract with their big label that they were with and were like, look, we're not going to tell the press in advance. We're not going to give advanced copies mm. of this album. Um, and at this point, they were still one of the most important and highest earning bands in the world. And they were just like, no, 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 we're going to put it out with no warning. This is before Beyonce did that shit. Before that was a thing you could do. They set That's that template. That's insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So like, but they're not the only ones to do this kind of stuff. It's just that they've always taken that kind of punk marketing vibe and been like, okay, well, how can we apply that? How can we make sure that no one is fucking with our shit? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. You I mean, know. it's it's a it's a it's a cottage industry stu- uh, you know, business model. What what um. What I often think about in these situations, these times like these, and examples that, that you've just given here with, with Radiohead, is perhaps like the underground create these prototypes, often neglected or considered a little bit kooky or, are you fucking crazy? You're going to buy it all yourself kind of conversations behind the scenes. But what happens is very much like nowadays, we're here, you're over there with, with your tech, I'm over here with mine, we're connecting and collaborating online. And these these sorts of projects that we're we're putting out here like this, they're the kind of things that the major labels now see and take advantage of the creativity to repackage it and use it in their um, promotional um, their promotional. Um, and they very rarely get it uses. right. They very rarely, right, like yeah. I've done some stuff with major labels over the years. I'm guessing you know I'm coming you from, right? Well. You get one. No, completely. Yeah. yeah. So like. I mean, the thing is with social media is that you can't fake success on it at all. Like, mm. um, I sometimes have these kind of conversations with my management where uh, they're like, uh, okay, so let's spend on gaming the algorithm to put ad spend behind a thing. And I'm like, there's really no fucking point. Like, if you're going to put money into something, put money into things which will make the art you make better. And then mm. it will just sell itself. Like you can buy your way around the algorithms if you're Unilever or Coca-Cola and you can put fuck, slow, fuck loads of money into the auctions yeah. for people's attention that constitute the ad model on these platforms. But if you're an artist making stuff 
just make better stuff or make stuff that's better suited to the particular platform that you're doing. So like, that, yeah, you know, for Instagram, definitely missed you know, as well. That's, you, that's being missed. You know, because you fucking, you work all these things really well. Like you're good at like segmenting things into things that work well. For, like your Instagram stuff, I've looked at and been like, that's the perfect Instagram fodder. I'm still kind of behind the curve oh. when it comes to that kind of stuff because I'm, I, I just don't get around to chopping things up into these perfect little chunks, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, you know what? It, it's 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 trial and error, and you can't. I mean, you know, I'm no example here. I, I you know, I, I'm I'm like the Bill Gates effect, where you find the laziest person, the hardest thing to do, and they find the easiest way to get it done. That that's that's kind of my mantra. But it means that I turn around shit quick. But it does take time, and a lot of people ain't got the patience for learning something. Including myself, you so know how I mean? many people you, are on the team doing this podcasting? Because you've got like outside reporters and you've got graphics. Like, how much of that is you? That's a, that's the a television live show. It's all it's all me. But I got a, my my guy Guam. He's my um, on the ground camera guy. He also deals with a lot of my um, he deals a lot of my uh, um, video. Oh, what's it called um, herpes. Yeah, video herpes. Yeah. He deals with, uh, <laughs> no, um, video... Uh, I can't remember. Video, that. that needs to be a yeah. tune. Right, let's make a fucking tune. Do it. Video, yeah. <laughs> or was it fucking, yeah. Let's go. There's a stray diggity. Whoa. I've got a stray diggity somewhere. <laughs> it might be in the. Actually, actually, sorry, that needs to finish the fucking. <laughs> that, that's that's sick because like um, it seems the delay, the delay that we've got is sort of bang on 140 BPM. It like fits. It's like bang on what like a crotchet is at 140 BPM. So yeah, so if we jam, it just needs to be at that tempo, and then it's always gonna work. Fucking a. That's awesome. And then loads of space to make loads of noise is even better. Yeah, fucking madness. That was uh, that was it. that was an interesting experiment. Yeah, I'm still getting my head around it. how to do this. We're trying to, <laughs> in the absence of actual ability to link up and jam, we're trying yeah. to find ways. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Innovate. Did, I honestly, did this idea, <laughs> the inception of it, came so randomly when, you know, we've been trying to work this one out for a little while, obviously due to the circumstances beyond our control, but also um, doing it on Zoom. We, but there were some latency problems. But when you started doing your thing on IGTV with the jamming and then you know working alongside Twitch and Patreon and and um, Discord, it's it, you know it, it all of a sudden Discord. Sorry, all of a sudden it was like, hey, there's. There's totally room to try and figure this out in an alternative style podcast, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm doing a podcast because it's 2020. And if you don't have one, you're breaking the law. You have to have a podcast in 2020. <laughs> it's like you're like, 
it's like an ID card. You don't exist if you haven't mm. got a podcast. So I was like, shit, mm. I better do one. No, but like it's going to be, <laughs> I'm just figuring out exactly how mad to make it. Because I did a podcast episode that was like me with guests and I've, I've spent ages like editing it and cutting it up. and make, It's just madness. And I sent it wow. to people to be like, how's this as a first draft? And they're like, that is a fucking head trip. And I was like, I don't know if I can do these more than <laughs> once a month. And then I contacted the guy at Acast who wants to put it out. They put out loads of podcasts. They're like a publisher right, or right. whatever. But they were like, um, yeah, it needs to be weekly. Because if it's not, then your audience kind of drops off throughout the month and then yeah, yeah. it doesn't build that momentum. So I was like, okay, but I can't do like a fast, like a deeply edited yeah. thing. Anyway, whatever. I'm just trying to figure out exactly how to work all this content creation into my schedule because I've got kids as well. It's just 2020. You've got to try and find a way to make shit that is of a good quality, is tailored to the specific platforms and distribution methods that are available, like podcasting, um, Instagram, fucking, uh, you know, YouTube. YouTube, yeah. YouTube and Twitch have completely different lengths and forms of and vibes of content that will work. Mm. And so it's about, for me, it's not so much about like thinking about marketing as like, how do I market myself with adverts? It's more like, how do I like channel my creativity into ways that fit into these tight little, uh, you know, prescriptive, uh, yeah. you know, genres that each I feel that. platform has, you know. I feel that. I, I mean, to, to, to a more broader extent, I've, I've kind of, I personally have gone to, you've, I've gone to where the audience is um, and steer, well, at least I, tr I, I like to think I do, steer people to the thing using those particular uh, social platforms. But, but even then, you've got to try and you've got to try and maximize, you know, get get a good spread of like where you are and what you are. Twitch and Twitch and Discord seem very similar, don't they? Uh, they're often used in conjunction. Discord is like just a, just a chat medium, like but Twitch is broadcast medium. Gotcha. So, yeah. Okay. Discord Discord is just for gamers to, to chat to each other, but like you know, um, they're, they're all really different, and it's sometimes it's a subtle thing. So like. If you're like trying to explain this to like an old age pensioner or something, you'll have a job doing it. But like, any anytime a new platform comes <laughs> up, like tick, like TikTok, for example, is amazing, and it gets it got derided for the first like year or so of its existence, certainly mm. by me. And then I checked it out, and I was like, oh my god, this is amazing! Like the amount of creativity. I fuck with this. I fuck with this. Yeah, yeah. Do you like TikTok? You want TikTok? Yeah, yeah. You I do the TikTok. You, know, you like it. You know the best way that I describe you like the TikTok. You, you know the best way I describe it is like you know when you get the, each each social media platform is like you're given one of those pictures. You know those ones that you have to look at and it's all different fuzzy colours and pick and you got to look <laughs> deep enough and then all of a sudden you've the got magic the magic eye things, stereoscopic. Yeah, yeah. Even that story dates dates you because that's dates fucking me that's from yummy. the nineties. Kids yeah, don't remember yeah, that the, shit. <laughs> There were only four TV channels in the 90s, kids. Sky was very yeah, yeah. new. It was very expensive. You could, not a lot of people could afford it, but you would, everyone had access to magic eye books, which looked like yeah. static. And then if you stared at it for long enough, your eyes would cross and you'd see a dolphin. That's and what Instagram is like. Wally? And where's Wally? That's what it is. Yeah, you stare long enough at Instagram and suddenly it clicks and you go, oh, yeah, I yeah. see what that's it is what now. <laughs> and this, that's why this analogy works because for a lot of old people, they can't see past the picture. You know what I mean? They can't see. Right, they and can't it's all just noise. It's all yeah, just, it's noise. just noise, but it comes. It's a kind of um, ut <laughs> utilitarian in the philosophical sense application of your consciousness to a platform where you're like, well, how can I use it for my own purposes? Um, yes, you know, yes. if you're just scrolling through it, it's one thing. If you actually want to use it, suddenly you become aware of the sort of mechanics behind it. Like the thing with the algorithm, that's quite a new thing for people to have got their head round. Like, you know, in 2016, when Trump happened, everyone was like, how the fuck did that happen? And then we all discovered yeah. that there are internet bubbles that we all live in. Yeah. That came into common parlance, but it had been happening for like five or six years, ever since, mm. maybe longer than that, ever since all these big platforms figured out that your attention is the precious commodity to yeah, be marketed yeah, to yeah, third-party yeah, yeah. advertisers. And now we've got the social dilemma out on Netflix where everyone's like, oh, have you seen the social dilemma? Do you realize that they're... <laughs> they're, they're <laughs> literally auctioning your attention to the highest yeah. bidder those of us yeah. who've been marketing on these platforms for a while are like i know it's fucked up yeah, yeah. but like 
that's news to a lot of people that were only sort of consuming stuff and just th- flicking their thumbs. But- would you could would you consume uh, if you were if you were a member of public that wasn't doing anything too creative, inspired, but probably you know you you kind of boy racer meets I don't know, go clubbing, you know, nine to five. Would you would you a be like intrigued enough to want to flick through Instagram or be 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 um, consumed by the algorithm? I don't. I, don't, well, I didn't I'm, like it. I didn't like Instagram when I first saw it. In fact, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I never used it almost out of principle for years because I was just like, ugh, what is this? You can't link outside of it. That annoyed me because I was like, well, yeah. that that's nefarious from the get-go. If you can't, you can only provide one link to an external website and that's in your bio. The good point. So you know they're, really trying, they're trying to keep you in their little ecosystem. So that means that yeah. they control exactly how your interactions go. And the nature yeah, of those interactions, fucked. the virality of any message you put out, that's a police, a, a sort of mental police state is, For real. is Instagram. Agree. I much prefer things like Reddit, where it's kind of a lawless, lawless free-for-all. And, uh, and you know, you, you can subdivide your digital life on Reddit into different categories and communities. And, yeah. and you don't, it's not one monolithic scroll experience yeah yeah yeah. yeah. that's yeah, when yeah. you know they're fucking with you is when and they're jumbling it up now as well like there's nothing in time real time it's all eight hours ago 16 hours ago five minutes ago it's like yeah you know, it's just like a, it's basically a fruit machine <laughs> yeah i mean i can i can see it from the perspective of facebook engineers and you know people that devise the youtube algorithm because i had these like long chats with i had like a partner manager it's called at youtube and it was this Top geezer, really cool. Um, but nice. yeah, yeah. I ended up being distraught at what he was telling me, where he was like, you know, he's like, oh, so you've got, you know, 200,000 subscribers or whatever. Uh, he was like, you can't get through to them automatically. They will not see the shit you're putting out. I was like, well, then what does subscription mean? He's like, well, we've sort of deprecated that feature. And I'm like, so your hundreds of thousands of subscribers are meaningless. He's like, yeah. And what? this was about three years ago that I was learning this stuff. And I'm like, what do you yeah. mean? How can they do this? And he's like, well, if you think of it from their perspective, um, the journey that YouTube's engineers have been on is this. We've made a website. It's got shit tons of video on it. Uh, people are leaving the site because it's all too confusing and they can't find the things that they love. Let's help yeah. them with that. Let's look at the kind of keywords and the videos that they like and give them more of that. People stayed on the website mm-hmm. more. Great. And all YouTube want to do is optimize the amount of time you're spending on the site so that you don't leave. So mm. your videos get weighted according to this huge set of algorithms uh, in terms of how likely they are to keep you on the site. If you click away from the from YouTube entirely, then no one is seeing that fucking video. If they watch your video to the end and then click another of yours, then they mm. will show that person more of yours. If they watch your video and then click onto one of someone else's that's a, that's a similar... Mm bunch of hashtags mm. then that's what they will do so they don't care about you as a creator they care about keeping people watching so they can sell more ad space i mean that's not controversial that's not no, conspiratorial they're, they're that's just now. their business model and like yeah but yeah i've been aware of just the intensity of that truth for about three years since i first started having meetings with the guys at youtube and only now people are coming to real like the consumers of it are only now coming to realize it and realize its nefarious effects on society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but having those subscriptions in turn on the flip side, they turn on certain activations within your channel, don't they? Like I think ten thousand you get. I know is it two thousand you get to ha- uh, use the YouTube Studios. I think it is, and then ten thousand is. Yeah, you get- but even that you have to you have to be lucky to get it because uh, right. it kind of it gets booked out only a week in advance so if you've got like a big project on where you really need a studio to do something it's you've got no way of guaranteeing ahead of time that you're going to get that studio space so it's mm. all it all serves a purpose but effectively well I don't know look my brother's a really successful YouTuber he does like edutainment kind of doc- yeah I met him doc- he's Did sound you? I like him yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, yeah well yeah he's, he's, he's great Jay Foreman check he's out he's just like you <laughs> that's how I, he I is, think I turned around to, I did a turn around beatbox. to him right <laughs> I turned around to him and it was backstage somewhere. He was hosting something. And I turned and I said, you know, you remind me of. <laughs> oh, how funny. Yeah. Yeah, we're quite similar. Brother. 
Yeah, we have the same mum <laughs> and dad. Were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These these similarities are uncanny. They are. We share lots of DNA. But like, <laughs> no, he's great. But anyway, but the point is, he um he has gone to lots of YouTube uh, uh, meeting things, like little best practice kind of things where. You know, it's like the Bilderberg group, but for YouTubers. So like they all <laughs> they all exchange best practices and, and they get told about aspects of the algorithm and stuff and about how to produce content that testing has shown people engage with. So it's like, look, up the quality of the cameras, um, keep your intros short, try, try a cold open, appeal to them to click the like and subscribe button or they won't. But so... The like button is interesting, but it's not the only mm. factor for the algorithm. If mm. you click it, the algorithm is more likely to show you that. If you subscribe to them, it's more likely to show you to show you more of those videos. The um, but then you know to actually be told that someone that you've liked the video of or subscribed to that um, you have to click the notification bell, which was a new feature that they yeah, added, which is a whole other. This thing, because yeah. of the wealth of content that was being produced, they had to have a way of dealing with the world what is it like thousands of hours per day are uploaded to mm. youtube much yeah, of it mad. dross you'd never want to see some of it miscategorized um and so what they were finding initially apparently was that um the really big youtubers like pewdiepie and all this kind of stuff they mm. they were getting total primacy over what was being seen so they were getting massive viewer numbers and starter startup channels weren't getting a look in so mm -hmm. Um, you know, all these big YouTubers kicked off about it at the time. And this is about eight years ago or something. But YouTube introduced new features to the algorithms that they use, which would take some of that attention away from the bigger ones and give it to the smaller ones. So they're constantly making these little tweaks. And yeah, what, they, yeah. what their goal is, is to, make, you know, so now you have your videos should be about 10 minutes long or thereabouts mm. um, in order to favor the algorithm gods. <laughs> Ah. But kind of yeah, but Instagram, in it's not the same. Podcast, it's yeah, not no, the same. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, in terms of discoverability, in terms of audience retention, in terms of the reasons why people go to a particular platform, the kind of people that go to that particular platform. You might have different demographics on each of these platforms because you mm. your shit suits one of these ones better or you've nailed the content production regimen on one better than the other. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. fuck all this shit. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean... <laughs> Fuck it. But this is, you know, this is enlightening. <laughs> it, not just for me, but I'm sure for everybody watching. You, you, I tell you, man. Like this, and this is your from your brother's point of view. Like you, you, you come from a family of pretty uh, well versed techers, don't you? Like, where does it all come from? Uh, where, where does this interest in tech come from? Interest in tech. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Like, in terms of like social media, I'm not. An expert like I had like I got in contact there's a guy called Graham Farmer who runs data transmission who also does a social media mentoring program and for a for a, a short while um I was like talking with him while he guided me through how to use Instagram because I'm that old and I'm that much of a fucking <laughs> Luddite when it comes to Instagram just because I didn't like the experience of Instagram but now that mm -hmm. I follow lots of people on Instagram that I'm in, interested in seeing the posts of now I like Instagram but only you know for perusing it because I follow the right kind of people that I like but like mm. I'm really a Luddite when it comes to social media so I don't like I don't like social media I rarely use it I don't like like Facebook I never liked I was a MySpace guy we're going all the way yeah. back but like when MySpace when MySpace came out it was coming from the right kind of place it was like you make art you consume art there's no real distinction between them. Yeah. Like you can either post your favorite tracks other people have made or you can post tracks that you've made. It doesn't matter. Like you decorate your page in a way that suits your style and you've got it's yeah. open season. It's all just HTML. You can do whatever you want. And like I used to love that. It was fucking great. And then yeah. it got bought by Rupert Murdoch, he of fucking Fox and and The Sun and all that and you know News mm. Corp, whatever they're called. And he kind of just deprecated it and just let it yeah. let it sort of just drain away and then he started promoting the Sun newspaper on it and technologically it got left behind and Facebook rose to supremacy so I don't know whether he did that because he wanted MySpace yeah. to go away or because he thought it would be a good acquisition but then he didn't hire the right kind of engineers oh that's interesting one yeah. of the two I don't yeah. know I don't know maybe he thought maybe. it would be a threat to established media and he wanted it gone or, or he's just terrible at 
at buying new media because it was a whole new thing. This Web 2.0 thing was a whole vibe that MySpace yeah. was at the head of. But it was a tragic loss for the arts community Huge. and for people in general, like, for culture. Yeah, it was, it was mixed. It was like a, a mixtape generation. Like yeah. you say, where you could decorate your own shit and it's just a little jukebox in there and all the different people you could follow. What and happened was, to mixtapes? Fuck it. Like, no, no. Do you know what? That is, like, you, you know, like, there was a, there, you, there used to be a thing called romance. <laughs> when you liked a girl, you'd make her, like, a, a cassette tape of tunes <laughs> that you thought she'd love and then she'd be like, I love him because of the tape. And then you'd take her to the yeah. village dance and you'd, you'd dance to the swing <laughs> and the bop and then you'd kiss in the moonlight and now you fucking stream your music on Spotify, you swipe a couple yeah. times so you find someone you like look of, go and have sex with them and never talk to them again. And the world Again, social sucks media now. Gone mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all falling in line, isn't it? It's it's just trying to make things. As, there's no hard in anything. It's all simple. <laughs> it has to be si just the, the sw swipe culture. <laughs> swipe culture. Shit. Swipe culture. Has there ever been anything more vacuous and fucking <laughs> ephemeral? Swipe culture. Because you could yeah. work for hours on a piece of art that you fucking know is groundbreaking yeah. in some way, and someone will go meh. And that's their interaction with it. Yeah, yeah. dude. But this, but this is it. It makes you <laughs> not want to do the, the art to a degree. It's like, well, well, you've heard the song after 46 seconds, have you, mate? You've heard the song after 10 seconds? Okay, cool. But, have you heard my song? Yeah. But the flip side of it is, even though algorithmic search and discovery has its clear pitfalls, um, mm. and... and, and we might romanticize the days when you had to actively seek out those aspects of culture which you wanted to, to immerse yourself in. And there, yeah. there was scarcity and physical objects. And so there was things were precious and sacred and, you know, vaunted, godlike, you know, kind of there's downsides to yeah, the yeah. way things were and upsides to the way things are now. So putting That's people right. in that godlike position where people were unattainable, you get people like Prince out of that, but you also get people like Michael Jackson, who was an evil <laughs> piece of shit. <laughs> Fuck you if you don't agree yeah. with me. That's how I feel. And like, comment below, kids. Yeah, comment, comment below. below. Was Michael Jackson or not a predatory pedophile? The answer is yes, he was. He was a piece of shit. No, but like, um, yeah. I don't know. You can listen to Billie Jean all you want. Fucking, yeah. Watch a couple of documentaries and shut the fuck up. No, but like, uh, yeah. Don't catch, don't let me catch you moonwalking. It's not cool anymore. No, but like, but, but, yeah, but this but new right. shit. You, yeah, right. you can have like, the algorithmic search and discovery thing and the availability of music. Yeah, artists don't get paid now, but like there are ways to get paid and um, yeah. there's still the thin end of the wedge stuff where there is Patreon and Kofi and fucking Bandcamp and all That's that kind of right. shit. If you want to learn how to use it and you can get seen, you can get seen if you make something good, it can be around the world in a matter of fucking seconds yes, and you can be an exactly. overnight success if you've made something that is truly dope. You don't have to yeah. spend out on a million pounds worth of equipment you can have your phone and make a hit. You can. Mm. So like, yeah, it's all just a conversation. It's all just push and pull. And like, there's advantages to the, you know, the, the old ways and there's advantages to the new ways. But you can't go back to the old ways. You might as well just fucking embrace what is and just fucking make some shit. And if it doesn't get yeah, seen, yeah. maybe it sucked. <laughs> you made me think, yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. <laughs> shit, try again. But, I mean, but the shit, try again uh, analogy, uh, you know what? You know what? This brings me nicely into something I've been thinking recently. Um, you know, both you and me have been in the industry for long enough. 20 years, to, man to, and boy. <laughs> but, but, but seriously, like, to what we're talking about here is um, being ahead of the curve, being, being, you know, being ahead of um, I, with ideas and being at one with technology. So, although we are talking about an old school thing like myspace like you know that that 80s you know what was great about music boom but but, but really because we've been in the, the industry for so long we can almost forecast i mean i can i don't know i'm sure you can as well we you learn to forecast you learn to, learn to forecast what's kind of about to happen but also what technology technologically you can adapt to what with what you're doing do you know what i'm saying no <laughs> what are you, you talking about? You, I'm talking about. I'm talking oh, you mean about like being, you see you, mean you see cycles, and so you know, yeah, like yeah, right. Well, what do you yeah. see coming? And, and then oh, technology. Great so, sir. What do you see <laughs> right, in the I'll future? I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Right. I'll give you an example. Who's going to win the like, US election? <laughs> oh, that's, that's a whole. That's, that's too deep. That's too deep. That I drown within the first. Um, but but okay, I'll give you an example. Right. Uh, 
at a time where my gigs were scarce and I was like, fuck it, you know, 2017, you know, something like that. And uh, I was like, fuck it. I, you know, my mate said, why don't you do a podcast? And I was like, oh, and I'll give it a go. But as I was like building up the armour to get an understanding of it, I realised that actually, you know what? This has a, this has a way of like, you creating this platform that almost like rebrands yourself and takes you out of that niche and that hole that you think you were in. And then all these other technology things come in and then obviously, you know, world disasters happen and you kind of thank yourself lucky. You're like, Jesus, thank God I, I fucking did that. And it's that kind of forecast I'm talking about. You know what I mean? Right. Just trying to execute a little bit of wisdom in trying to diversify your sources of income and, and adapt to things. I mean, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think may, maybe the likes of you and I who come from the old world when computers were novel and there was no such thing as social media, we might see it as like, you know, some sort of gallant act of, 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 like, of like, you know, the accrual of wisdom to, to yeah, like yeah, yeah. get like a whole bunch of different uh, approaches to things but I think for kids these days that's their world like it's that's what they do yeah it comes very naturally like it used to be that, mm. that there was a clear path in music and like probably not for the likes of you and I where it's like okay let's make beatbox a career because certainly when you were doing it I think you were the first person to make a career beatboxing and that for me I had your example and Razelle's and so my generation was like five years after or something which was like okay that's right let's do the beatbox thing like those guys but somehow add something else to it or whatever or advance it a bit or whatever as much as you can or whatever but like for kids these days mm. the wealth of options available to you is massive so like yeah true you know like very true so, so yeah. beatboxers of maybe our generation it was kind of a weird thing to think of doing to like make the noises with your face people are like what's that oh it's this beatbox thing mm. oh what you mean like will smith did once no 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 no, no. it's way better than that <laughs> or like you know um and, and then you have to explain what dougie fresh is and then Razelle comes along makes it a little bit more mainstream within like the sort of wider sort of underground music scene everyone's like yeah. oh shit that's dope so suddenly a whole bunch of beatboxes come out of the woodwork and they're all trying to do it. So then beatbox becomes an art form, but there's still a trajectory where it's like you win a fucking beatbox competition, or at least that was for my generation. There was a beatbox competition for yours. There was none. So like, <laughs> you know, so then that was <laughs> that a trajectory. Sense. So it was like you win that, then from that you get wider acclaim and you get gigs and stuff. But like now, <laughs> live gigs, especially in 2020, live gigs aren't necessarily the be all and end all. Like there's a guy... No, yeah. Do you know True. about um, uh, Mr. Wobbles? He's a no. fucking absolute legend. And he's like... What's he do? He's a, he's a beatboxer. But like... Yeah. Um, but he's won a bunch of competitions in the US. He's sick. And he did a bunch of YouTube videos where he was driving Uber and beatboxing for his Uber passengers. That's awesome. And it's a great idea. He does it really well. Like... He's a hilarious guy and he's got this like acerbic, like very like internet kind of sense of humor and stuff. And he's just a lovely bloke and like it's a great piece of content and that's got hundreds of thousands and millions of views over time. And so he focused on that. So like True. that and that's yeah, earning yeah, yeah. him money. But he didn't yeah, expect yeah, yeah. that to be a career, but that's his career. And then he was doing Twitch and smashing Twitch, but then he got thrown off of Twitch for like accidentally doxing someone or pretending to or whatever. So like he's had to adapt mm. really, really savagely. He's never played a gig in his fucking life. Never. Never played a Crazy. headline. Never played a headline show. Wow. Never he did one in someone's living room, such as the demand for his live work. But it doesn't matter because he's earning a comfortable living, more comfortable than someone who's stressing about where they're going to play the next toilet gig in some fucking mm. rundown venue in fucking, you know, Bosnia. Like, you can you can do shit from wow. your own house. That shit's inspiring as fuck. So I yeah, so that. like, yeah, it's all this like, so for the likes of you and I, uh, we're from a generation where there was at least something you could understand that was like, there's a world, you play gigs in it, and then promoters who've booked you pay you for the people that have physically come into the venue that's kind of going away. And like 2020 mm. has hastened that. You know, like it was never going away be before 2020, but like but it's gone a, for the next year. But from a B-Box point of view though, that, that serves fairly good because, you know, even Reaps and the, 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 the guys not too far away from us arm's length, they, they've always, 
I've never, you know, Reaps has never put out an album. You and I have, but like he's of that generation where he kind of he kind of made it all right to just be yourself and orbit within a creative space. You've had Reaps on, too right? much commitment. You've yeah, had Reaps, yeah, a yeah. couple of times. Yeah, he's an inspiring motherfucker because he will totally. go and play to Davos and give a talk about creativity and then go and do a bunch of fucking incredible artwork that's really idiosyncratic and totally. He's a fucking legend. He's also like yeah. a chess genius. He yeah, really man. is a special guy. Like he's <laughs> he's so fucking clever. And he dresses like he's in the Matrix all the time and he's an absolute G. Like Love it. It's totally I just <laughs> I love beatboxers, man. They're just like there's something about the kind of person that ends up being a beatboxer has savage ADD, cannot control their <laughs> mouth, and like is just driven to imitate things and just it's a, there's now a language that's fucking come about. Like, if you don't know, if you don't frequent beatbox circles a lot, which I didn't for years, and then dip back in, I was like, what the fuck? It's like, what is this it's Pandora? like, like li- lifting up a paving slab to find an ant's nest. And you're like, ah! Like, yeah, yeah, it's dude. crazy. They're, they've got, uh, like, so if you like something, if you're a beatboxer talking to another beatboxer and you like what they're doing and you think it's dope, you say, esh, which is just like a fucking, a word that only exists in the beatbox community. And it's, it's, Pan linguistic, like it doesn't matter what language you speak. You're like esh esh. It's a thing. It's That's got its own mad. language. Do you know that shit? I don't know that shit. <laughs> you don't know about esh. Like honestly, it's no. so. It's only when I've like hung out in these circles when I've been like judging a competition or something or like, and I get to. I'm like wow. Like the level of t- and so. But someone like me walks in. And they're like, oh shit, baby, man, I've been listening to you since I was three years old. I was like, fuck you. <laughs> but like, but like, you know, I'm like, do yeah, I have... I don't know about Esh, so, so yeah, I'm angry. <laughs> no, but like, yeah, like, I don't know, it's easy to resent people for their age, like, alone. But like, it's such a loving community of encouragement and personal growth and the growth of the art form. It's fucking nuts. Like, you and me did a little panel thing with oh, Reeves at that. the yeah. beatbox uh the, the UK beatbox championship then that was right. that was mind blowing because then I felt yeah. like it was like successive generations it was like three former presidents meeting up and doing <laughs> <laughs> but then you've got all these kids who are like amazing yeah, like my kids are learning to beatbox now and I haven't pushed it because I didn't want to be that weird pushy dad but they're like you know they're doing it that's and, amazing but I feel like like for the older beatboxers who were actively discouraged from beatboxing because it was seen as some weird nervous tick. Like, you know, we had to learn that it was okay to do it. And you know, as before we like came out as a beatboxer, it's like, I've been struggling with it all my life. I'm a noisemaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I make noises with my face and I can't help it. And now kids today are like, I would hope, like actively encouraged by their parents when they hear them doing it. Like, yeah, yeah, oh, exactly. you're beatboxing. That's a thing. That can be like, a career. Actually, a curricul- yeah, yeah, a national the curriculum. curriculum or something. Yeah. Why not? Um, I've actually, to be honest, and this is always, I don't know whether this has tr- helped or hindered me, or rather, uh, it's troubled me at times, but I don't really suffer from any ADHD, so therefore, when when I would ever, like, beatbox or anything, I would have, like, these short spurts, uh, albeit, like, 10,000 hours growing up, you know, from, like, the age of seven or something, but I w- it was just something that was so natural to me. I- even now, I don't feel like I have this, like, instinctual, I can't control myself urge to beatbox like maybe someone with ADHD would. Do you know what I mean? Have you ever had a test? No, I haven't that though. Because you might pass it. (laughs) Like, you never know. Like, I think every, I think every artist is on some kind of spectrum. Spectrum. And like, I think so. I think you get diagnosed with being an artist. I think like, there are some people who are happy to never write a poem or draw a drawing or like sit down and, and obsessively learn a piece on, on some instrument. Mm. Artists are not those yeah. people. Artists are people who are fucking so driven to obsess over the aesthetic nature of something and try and reproduce True. it and get lost in that. Like that's kind of special and lots of people have it, but it's a particular kind of thing. You clearly have it. You always started off as a as a graffiti artist, no? Uh, no, I do well illustrative. I used to do stuff for magazines and stuff. But yeah, there was. So the bug is in you. Right. It's just in you. you yeah, know? Like, in there, maybe yeah. you just learn to channel these create. Like, I don't think t- it's channeling. If yeah. you had to stop being creative, would you go nuts? Because I fucking. Oh will. fuck yeah! Right. So yeah, yeah you got something, something great, something that's like 
in you that needs to come out that you can't stop doing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what that fucking yeah. is. But I think you get what diagnosed yeah. with artistry. I don't think you do it. I think if you try and, <laughs> like, you might find something that's not quite your medium, but, like, you'll still fucking give it a go because it's in you yeah. to just obsessively do it. Some people don't have the patience or the will or the inclination, you know? Yeah, yeah. Some people's desires are, uh, 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 t- t- you know, like money and things like that. Cars and yeah, yeah. But artists, I mean, I you know, I listen. Artists man, are generally they, quite bad with money because yeah, yeah. that's not their focus. Like some people, the thing that they create is their own wealth or the wealth of others, or like it can be whatever. It could be like a business. It could be yeah, could be a charity. Whatever it is, is like you'll create some. Everyone has to create something, but it's like for people who are who have an obsessive focus on the aesthetic. Could be sonic. Could be um, visual. Sometimes it's both. Often it's both. Yeah, you know. But it's it's that well, from your obsession. from your point of view though you've got so you've got the tech side of things. This has always like intrigued me about you and your style because you've you it's almost like it's the, the Eddie Van Halen effect. Rest in peace. Rest in it's peace. like you, you're using the tech as the like you like he would have the the electrics within the guitar. It's like this is like an extension to your vocals. And uh, I wouldn't I say I'm Eddie Van Halen. If if we're drawing a comparison, hey, listen, I'd say if it was the Eddie Van Halen. If, the Eddie Van Halen. I think that's probably. I think D'Lo might be Eddie Van Halen. That kind of because Eddie Van Halen wasn't an effects guy. He was like yeah, a purist, sure. like purist, just extreme chops and feel and vibe. I think I'm more. Who am I? If I'm a guitarist. Maybe like um, Adrian Bellew or like Robert Fripp. Who Robert Ooh, Fripp? Because right. Robert Fripp fucking invented uh, looping, or like he was one of the first people to. It, it was actually fucking. Oh, what's his name? Um, oh shit! Um, Les Paul. Les Paul. The oh, fucking, there you go. Yeah, boom, boom. He invented looping. Uh, he was the first person to fucking do it. He was like, okay, if I have a tape loop, I can play guitar on it and I can loop myself up. And he used to do it for like five minutes in the middle of a show where he's, you know, doing his, uh, you know, genius guitar twiddling. And what is this sorcery? This looping sorcery? Yeah, people will go, people yeah. will go nuts, but it was only a trick. And like, um, and then Robert Fripp started doing it to make textures, and Brian Eno was doing it with these really long things. But it only became oh, a thing. Hold tight, Brian Eno. Wow. Hold tight, Brian Eno. Yeah, no. Do you know what? <laughs> I fucking I was hanging out with Herbie Hancock. Incidentally, so I can die now because that's something I've done. And like, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and wow, that he's such a just. You know, God level G. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, Without question. Yeah, and hanging out with him, he's a lovely, lovely guy, as you'd expect. And like, mm. but I'm with him in his studio, and we're jamming and stuff, which has never seen the light of day. But like, I have those recordings. I should maybe put them out. I don't know. But like, hell yeah, you maybe, should. Uh, what the fuck? But we were just fucking around. It's like, but anyway. So he, um, but he plays me this stuff that he did with Brian Eno, and it's Brian Eno with chaos pads looping, and no, and it's like. Amazing, but not. It's never going to be Christmas number one, and it's debatable whether yeah. people would rave about it as being some big seminal meeting of these two giants because they were just fucking around. But that's cool. So, like, he's probably got vaults and vaults of dope shit, which just doesn't quite cut the <laughs> level of genius that he would need it to pass muster. But like, hearing yeah. that was nuts because I was like, "Who's this?" And he's like, "This is me and Brian Eno." I was like, "Shut up!" That's insane. It's amazing. That's insane. Yeah, it's beautiful. Why was it? See, what, that's what oh. I'm saying about legacy. That's what I'm saying about career span. You know, I mean, you, we both, you, but you particularly, you know, you've walked a, you've walked a path. That's Have I? I think things. I stumbled off the path several times and then never quite found it again and just tried to make new ones, hack my way through the jungle only to find fucking bears that fucking <laughs> ate a couple of my fucking internal organs but I'm struggling on and fucking just... Do you really feel that? <laughs> do you feel like you lost, do you really feel like you, you lost your path? I don't, I don't know I mean, what did... my path ever really was. I don't know. I just feel like in 2020... We're all with a machete made of art hacking through a jungle made of social media. And that's just what we're all doing. And like everyone's on a level playing field. I do think that though. Like, look at fucking the established media and their ability to churn out programming that is separate on a production level from what people can do on their own. Mm. They can't do it anymore because uh, any show that is. Um, that, that requires an audience and a high production budget, you can't pull that shit off. You'll have like no. a skeletal audience. Um, yeah. And it'll sound weird and awkward and everyone's wearing 
masks when you cut to their faces to show whether they're enjoying it or not. So that shit's out the window. <laughs> like uh, yeah, yeah. all the kind of the, the unless s- it's a drill concert. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, they they go in, and like all the the mainstream satire stuff, which is great. It's now just someone talking to camera without an audience, which is what anyone can do if their writing is good enough and their delivery is good enough. Mm. And I got friends who are doing that. Uh, and check out Jolly and Rubenstein, um, who is amazing. You should get him on. He's great. But he's he's doing nice. a thing now which is every bit as good as what sort of John Oliver is putting out, um, or at least in that category. You know, John Oliver's Ooh, next. Okay, okay. but like, uh-huh. um, but he's done some interesting stuff over the years. Like he was doing stuff with a. a big budget sort of TV thing that won a BAFTA uh, back in the day. What was it called? Um, the Revolution Will Be Televised. Um, and it was him and this guy Hayden and they smashed it. And that was with a TV budget. Um, nice. And they did some amazing kind of punk stunts and shit like that. And and now he's a producer on um, Don't Don't Hate the Players. But he's also doing this satire thing, which is just him sat in front of a camera, minimal production, but it serves the fucking purpose of meeting that requirement of like giving you the information, the satire, the comedy. Um, it's well scripted. It's well delivered. He's got cutaways to the things. There's no difference. This is my point. Sorry, it's long winded. But there's no fucking difference between something that you can do on your own and something that a big budget production can make. Because anyone's got a fucking camera. You can produce shit on your fucking phone. So, yeah, I do feel like my so-called career has been kind of winding path but I think that's life and I think like everyone's on the same play, uh, level playing field and especially because yeah, like your true. subscription numbers mean nothing so like yeah, true. if you've got no subscribers it doesn't matter your shit can be seen by millions because it has resonated with the first few people that saw it and the algorithm gods make sure that it gets seen by other people that like the same kind of shit or you can have millions of subscribers but you put out a piece of shit no one wants to engage with the algorithm doesn't let people see it because it values the attention of the users over the primacy of of your content so everyone's on a level playing field you just need to make stuff that resonates and that's all it is doesn't matter how much money you've got doesn't matter how many subscribers you've got doesn't matter what your journey's been thus far doesn't matter what your goals are if you make dope shit that suits the algorithm for any particular platform Mm. it'll get seen if it doesn't it wasn't right for the platform or it was a stinking piece of dog shit <laughs> and you've got yeah yeah and you've got to be disposable it's it's cookie cutter embrace like disposability trying. you know mm. that's the order of the day I think which is why this streaming that's, thing's okay because it's, that's it's true. churning it out but whatever that's why I've always appreciated <laughs> graph writers man because they'll just like throw away you know tag here tag there piece there been painted over the next day who cares I've always I've always admired that the throwaway you know? nature of it yeah, but then I'm again, precious. there's also there's also a part of like, you know, painting on a wall where it becomes sort of more permanent than if you were just putting it on some paper. Because then someone from the mm. council's got to come off and remove it if you ever want it gone. So it becomes like part of people's lives, you know. Yeah. But, I mean, it's funny actually, isn't it? What do you think about you know graffiti culture as once was when it was like I've just done a fucking permanent installation on a wall that you are going to walk past and you have to see it versus like doing the same kind of piece of art, putting it out on Instagram, Ooh. and then it doesn't necessarily get seen by anyone unless the algorithm's on Instagram. It. Yeah, you know, I think it, I, 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 I'd say it falls in line with, like with everything else. I, if anything, especially after this conversation, I think the people that are mostly fallen a little bit back is the musicians and music industry. We're very lucky because as beatboxers, we, we kind of fall in between the bracket of what is music and what is entertainment, what is what is a host and what is an artist. And it's the same with graph in a way. It's like, who, what is art and what isn't? What is throwaway, what's not? Well, nothing's what's anything. Tag, what's nothing is yeah. anything anymore. There, there are no things. Yeah. There's just stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, I genuinely believe that. That sounds kind of nihilistic and, and circular and, and, and dumb. But I genuinely think that there aren't things anymore. There's just stuff. Like, yeah. for example, on this one, like, this is your podcast. However, I've asked you loads of interview questions and you've answered them. So whose is it really? Also, this is going out on the internet. <laughs> this is going out on the internet and it's part of your podcast. So like people might discover this through some kind of fucking algorithm through Google or whatever. And then um, they might have been searching me, but they find you and then they're on that then they find out more stuff about you. But essentially, as a piece of content that just lives on the internet, it is just <laughs> that. It's content. Yeah. Like the idea yeah. of content is a disturbing word for me. And I've been doing a lot of thinking about this recently and I still haven't got my head around it. When did art make way for content? What is the difference between the two? Is that important? I think it is. I think that the mm. um, I think that the algorithm in any given platform 
is the artist and all you're ever doing is giving um, material for that artist to use. And the actual artistic experience, the actual product is every frame that is refreshing on the fucking, you know, 120 hertz display or whatever. That's 120 different pieces of art per second as you flick through Twitter, Instagram, fucking whatever. And, and oh my God, yeah. It's, it's a bit mind-blowing and might sound a bit wanky, but I just think it's important to sit back and take stock of the artistic landscape as currently is, if only for the sake of sanity. Yeah, man, you just blow my mind. Was that too I, much? Can I Was add, that too deep? No, no, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. And I'll add value to that, actually, looking at what your habits are. Because if you're consuming art in a certain way, how, how do you expect people to consume your art in any other way that's yeah like maybe you're only like there's an artist called uh beeble crap and um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. oh Jesus, you know he's, he's awesome. amazing he's amazing yeah, he produces great. a new piece of artwork every day it's the best piece of art you'll see that day it's yeah. it's this beautiful intelligent prescient piece of satirical like you know graphic <laughs> surreal realism and like <laughs> heavy shit and yeah it's, it's it's always kind of satirical and always on point and he's doing one a day. But that seems like that's kind of what you have to do. Unless, yeah. But then again, you could be someone like Bill Wirtz or if you don't know Bill Wirtz, check him out. Or yeah. um, David Firth, who produced work very infrequently, but it's still perfectly suited for YouTube in that it is... Like, no one would ever commission it to go on telly. Like, go Beeble, on crap, the, Beeble Crap, though, is on, on Instagram, right? It, He's on all the platforms, Most, but yeah, Instagram is yeah. what he's best suited for. But like, his kind of art is perfect for that because like, yeah. you'll, you'll thumb past it and you go, mm -hmm. oh, there it is, there's the Beeble crap for the day and you'll be like, that's dope. You'll look at it for a good seven and a half seconds. You'll take it in, um, then you'll do your shit and you'll, uh, you'll flick past it, you'll have liked it and you'll wash your hands and you'll get on with your day. But that's what art's become. There's so much mm. of it that it changes. And, but artists are always operating in a paradigm. You know, uh, you know, the sort of abstract expressionists were operating in this area of intense um, theoretical exploration where it was about the statement you could make and how raw you could make that expression and how detached you could make it from physical representations of the real world. <sighs> But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and but it was gallery culture. It was if you wanted to see a piece of art, you really had to go to a gallery. So, you know, you got people putting upturned urinals in art exhibitions to make a statement about that kind of gatekeeper uh, the uh, sort of culture that existed yeah, but yeah, it was yeah. just afforded by the way the times were you know you have uh, the fact that singles ended up being three and a half minutes long because that was the length of a uh, the length of time you could fit on a record then you've got an LP a long player which you can fucking mm. that <laughs> defined what an album was is that it takes you about yeah. a year to record stuff it used to be six month turnaround but then you're making the amount of music you can perfectly fit on a large vinyl record played at a certain RPM that ends up like the medium ends up defining what defining what the art is mm. and these days the medium defines entirely as ever what the art is so you just have to think of streaming in that context podcast in that context and content i mean there's been a mind blower for me to get to grips with that to create stuff you have to have a thoroughgoing uh just knowledge of the the places it will end up like a working knowledge yeah. of, of what suits that which is and yeah it can and seem icky well. but it's not it's always been that way yeah, it has always been that way, but um, there's a lot of platforms out there. How do you, how do you govern what is quality within within a like you say a, a seven seconds or yeah? Because you've got to really sp spread out your day. Like okay, between t literally between ten and twelve, I'm doing that. Between twelve and two, I'm doing that. You know, and you have these designated times in which these platforms perform best with content you throw at them. And there's all these different variables that often make you feel like you're spinning plates and just waiting for something to. You know, you, you, you're close to the buffers. You know what I mean? Job requirement. It's a, it's a pretty full on job. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty full on job. It's a, it's a pretty full on. Job. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, which time, place, <laughs> with a...
Give me some more noises, man. Let's fucking let's do this. Uh, yeah, give me some more noises, man. Let's fucking. Yeah, give me some more noises, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get into it. See, this is what I need. I need people to just see the waveform. I've got to. Bonkers. Do you know what I can fucking do? I can try and make a synthesizer out of that. Go and do it. Shit, wait, do that again? Okay, let me do it again. I'm gonna replace that fuck. Wow. Give me, give me the biggest snare. That you got. Well, not the biggest. Give me a bunch of fucking snares. <laughs> that's the color snare. I fucking. That's the fucking. I love that shit. That's the. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, it's going backwards. Oh, that's why. Yeah, it's got that drop shit. It's so sick. That fucking... Yeah, <laughs> yeah fucking... Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you ever think that snare would make a fucking good instrument other than the snare? Cause it's... That's the thing, because it's got that fucking tonality to it. The fucking... Yeah, is yeah, it, is yeah. It it's the... got a drop is to it... it. Go on, do it again. <laughs> That's sick, man. That's fucking... I love that shit. Yeah, yeah. That's the shit. 
See, I love that. This is this is this. <laughs> oh yeah, fucking. <laughs> When I was first learning, when I was first learning to beatbox, um, like me and my mate Lee always used to listen to you and like would always comment on the bed spring noise that was this fucking like because you I, this is what I was just saying before we started recording I was like just like venerating your style over and above anyone else's because I was like you seem to sculpt the whole sound and I've never seen anyone else that ever tries to do that where it's like you're fucking was it like producing a snare sound. But when you fucking beatbox, you're fucking beatboxing the entire sound of the track. Like, it's almost like you're seeing the spectral diagram. And no one else has got that fucking style. Like, everyone else has got, you know, I'll do this noise now, I'll do this noise now. But for some reason, maybe you don't think about it like that in your own head. How do you think about it? Like, are you consciously, like, doing one thing, then another thing? Or do you just get guided by the flow of what you're, like, what you want to hear? No, I see. I hear everything flat. So, right. and that sounds really stupid, but if it's like, if it's like, flat then you see all the you see everything for its for its the sound value so if you're missing I, you know i've always done stuff to compensate what i lack right so i'll if i may not have the sub on a certain you know i've got quite a high range voice you know i'm not really like super deep or nothing so i do things that compensate that and it often it goes lower and it finds its way now i don't really I, i've never really thought too deep about it apart from i want to i want to capture the whole uh, the whole um, frequency range frequency range yeah. yeah that's the only thing it's just so mad like because there's stuff that you're doing that where I just no one else has that style like like not even people like D'Lo or Dani or these kind of people like it's never it feels to me like every beatboxer is trying to do specific noises in specific ways but with you, I can never tell what something is necessarily supposed to be. Or I can if it's like, you know, it's kick, snare, hi-hat. Like you used to do that fucking routine where it was, you know, showing people this, the snare, this, the hi-hat, this, the kick. But then very quickly, you're layering things up in a way that like not even Razel does that shit. Maybe Razel's the only other person I've heard that sort of does it. But with you, it's so amorphous. Like, so, you know, do you know the Lyrebird? Have you seen the Lyrebird? Uh, yeah, we talked about it earlier. We did. Yes. That's what it does. It's like... Yeah. It's like there's a, a sonic spectrum and it fucking just gets as close as it can. And it does practice. Yeah, yeah. But like... It is practice that does that's, that. But that's... Yeah, it has these little practice sessions where it's like rehearsing the noises and stuff. But like, I can't imagine that it's taking things apart and being like, okay, well, that's a buzz saw, that's a mobile phone. Like, it's probably just <laughs> approximating. But like, I yeah. don't know. Because like, the, your, your style is the kind of shit that is in my brain when I'm really high and, and beatboxing. But you managed to do it. Like I've never managed to get that process out of my brain and into my beatboxing. Like I've always, I've never had the guts to like just let my mouth just try and make a noise with little regard for whether whether it's a specific fucking thing. I probably sound crazy, but like yeah, because it that's doesn't always actually, marked out your style to me. I know. I really appreciate you saying that because it's reciprocated. Because when I hear you do mimicking a lot, you you do a lot of stuff where I'm like, fucking hell, how would you get? Do you know what I mean? I think you conceptualize your beatbox really well. In the same I rarely way fucking I beatbox anymore. I fucking, I use it as a component element. So I'm like, I like that I've got like a fairly malleable voice, but like. And You've got I, a mad malleable voice. Yeah. That, that is something that is like, yeah, like I could never. But I don't do I tricks anymore. The guts for that. Like I never, like I've almost given up on trying to learn new sounds because there's some noises that I just can't fucking do. Like the new generation of sounds take much longer to learn because they are, like, I, I still can't do it. Can you do a lip roll? Um, oh, you got it. I can't do it. 
Uh, no, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. It wasn't called a lip roll when I was doing it. Oh, do you wait, know what yeah, because you were doing that shit fucking 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, though, what they've done, like you say, they've advanced it to the point where it can be distinguished as its own thing. And what I would have done then, I would never have considered doing now. But we did talk about this earlier, that there, there is a repetition with a lot of the new schoolers that they copy other people. Yeah, these fucking kids. No, no, it's amazing. <laughs> they have... They have a pool of sounds, an entire lexicon. And to be part yeah, yeah, of the yeah. beatbox community, like for real, you really have to know every single one, which is the same you as it is with any art form. Language. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah. like Bake Off. Do you know what I mean? Like you have to know <laughs> how to make specific fucking patisserie yeah. or you're not a proper pastry chef. You need to be able or to do all chords, the... You know? Yeah, right, exactly. It's a lexicon. It's a <laughs> bake-off. Is that the best analogy? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. Think of it like it's you're the true. Mary Berry of fucking bass lines, man. <laughs> oh, hold tight. <laughs> <laughs> hold killer, tight, Mary killer. Berry in the Pliz Ace. <laughs> oh god for those of you outside the UK looking in Mary Berry <laughs> Mary Berry is an old lady who's lovely and makes delicious cakes and don't say a bad word about her because she's the real yeah. queen fuck that yeah. stupid yeah. woman with the gold hat and he takes all our tax money and spends it on predatory paedophiles yeah. that knock about with fucking people with their own private islands on no islands, Mary yeah. Berry is the real queen and Stephen Fry oh oh I like it yeah 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think Stephen um, Fry should enter the next um, UK Beatbox Championship, and I think I think he'd crush it. <laughs> or he should at least be the host. He should be the host, yeah. Yeah, he should be the host. He should be up at the balcony. He should be. He should be up there with the rest of them, like on Young Ones when they did the uh, University Challenge. They they need to be behind the stage giving their kind of pundit review. Yeah. Have you ever crowd surfed while beatboxing? No. You're joking. No, never. Oh, <laughs> and now you can't because of because of COVID. Crowd surfing yeah. is a revolting thing to imagine doing. But like, <laughs> yeah, 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 no, I did that only once, and I damaged my knee on a barrier because I'd never done it before. And uh, but it was ah, lo- yeah. that was lots of fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only thing I was ever told is like never do it face forward. That's the rule. Yeah, you, everything gets smacked out. Bollocks with your knees, balls out. Face. Yeah, what ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Microphone. Where did that go? <laughs> I'm, on top of, I'm on top of people slowly bleeding. <laughs> I was leading the death. Fucking okay, so wait, say that again. That needs to be a sample for a hardcore tune. Bleeding the death. Bleeding the death. Bleeding the death. Bleeding the death. Yeah. Bleeding the death. 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 Bleeding. 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 Bleeding synth. Uh, <laughs> oh my god. Oh my you, how often do you do this a day? How often do you do this? Bleeding the death. 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 Sounds like a seal. <laughs> That's like that's like <laughs> drum and bass clubbing a seal to death. That's what that is. That's I'm terrible. I'm still like I'm completely, completely spellbound as to how quickly and how intuitively you work with your equipment, dude. It still blows my mind. Hey, man, we just uh, we just solved the seal clubbing drum and bass dispute. I think we deserve <laughs> yeah. at least an Emmy. Well, we'll get, uh, we'll get um, some uh, canned laughter and ch- a round of applause and how's that? <laughs> Fucking seal clubbing and bass. Do you know what I mean? Because if you can't do... Hey, you can't do clubbing because of COVID, but you can still go to Alaska and beat the shit out of a baby seal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. 
while emceeing as you do it. I can't fucking... Have you ever had... Um, have you ever had Skibbity on? Yeah, I have. He He's invented... An absolute legend. Actually, wait, did he invent the Munna Who was the originator of the Munna Oh, I'd, I'd like to think someone like... I mean, Stevie Hyper D or someone like that. I'd was he the first person I, to I, say Munna? I would be guessing, <laughs> but Skib, Skib has always had that kind of thing. It, 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 it kind of, he's got that uh, uh, early hip hop thing, but a lot more faster. The skibba da da that thing. He's got that real quick thing. He's it? a joke. Did you ever consider being an MC? I wasn't. I, I used to freestyle rap a lot when I was younger, for sure. Like I used to, I used to go to, come to London every weekend and avidly think I was the next Farrah Munch, but. <laughs> but then the beatbox thing was just a lot more easier because no one else was doing it. I've got to say, man, the 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 absolute laser focus on on beatbox that you must have had, whether it was intentional or not, in like the late nineties, when it just wasn't a thing, is mm, fucking thing. admirable, man. Like it's just <laughs> it's amazing. Like how the fuck, like, what's your origin story as a beatboxer? Was it just other people giving you gigs because they were astounded that you were doing it and then you ended up doing it more? Or did you, yeah, like, set it. out? So you never set out, like, I'm going to do this as a thing. I'm going to no. make people do things. So it just happened. No. Yeah, no. I mean, you know, it, it was lit. It, 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 without going down those kind of rock and roll cliches, you know, when you, <laughs> you know when you're doing something and you're like, what, so I'm 18 years old and I, I go there and I get drunk there's loads of girls and what well, I get paid as well <laughs> for doing this. Like that was, but but there, but there was a there was a conscious effort to d define myself outside the lane of a Bismarcky or a Razel. You know what I mean? I I definitely wanted to add contribute because I was into the hip I was into the hip hop culture. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I wanted to add something. I wanted to add value to the organism. But uh, yeah, but it wasn't really, it was more like, yeah, okay, it's a gig, have this. Here, there, there. Hey, do you want to come do this photo shoot? Hey, maybe you should come do this magazine. It was all of that. And I was just saying, yeah, the whole time because it was just no, no one else there was doing it. I mean, there were, no <laughs> there were no exemplars. Like, it's almost, like I, th I don't know if you're given the credit as being the prime innovator of what a beatboxer is these days because Razel is certainly the first person in the beatbox chronology that I can think of to have gained widespread acclaim even to an extent outside oh, yeah. of the heads um, yeah, for real but like you sort of did that before he did like you know at least before he hit this country like you were de facto mainstream along with every other top 10 uh, song songsmith in terms of you know, like you, there was a point where you were on the fucking gossip columns of the fucking sun from, from <laughs> fucking beatboxing, from fucking beatboxing. Like uh, there is not I a beatboxer alive today that has a chance of doing that. And like, yeah. I mean, that's mental. Like if people yeah, don't, if beatboxers today don't realize just how much of a fucking example you set for <laughs> the idea of being a beatboxer first and foremost and have that be your actual job to be like, I'm a beatboxer, I beatbox, you fucking love it and, and, and it can be mainstream. Like, it was that unusual what you were doing. And he is out there. And, I mean, do you, you realise you're the, the first, essentially, to like, you, you ha there was a point where you had more mainstream uh, recognition than Razel has ever got. Like, that's nuts. Was a That's fucking yeah. nuts. That's nuts. There was definitely a transitional. It was definitely a transitional moment. I think you know, the date in the Patsies and things like that didn't. <laughs> you know that. They, they only feel oh, that, that was why you of, got on the sun, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you yeah, like, ended up with a like famous girlfriend and stuff. But like, but even before that, like, yeah, you were a a mainstay on uh, festival stages when there literally were no other beatboxers and still that p it was hard for people to even define what it was you were doing and for you as well like yeah, yeah, that was because of the smart. noises because of the noises that you were doing there was no lexicon of sounds to define what each fucking sound was so it's almost like 
you're this like oh it's binge and purge man i'd like the the the, the sun man you, the, you you got to remember like everyone everyone it, it, that's everyone that's in this beatbox forum at the moment anyone that's watching it and is a beatboxer themselves all they want to do is put their hat and ring and say ah, right so this is my sound this is my definitive they no one they even want to get paid you know what i mean they <laughs> but they want they want to get they want to have their mark me i just saw it differently and i was just like well it, it, you can speak to the choir you know you can speak to the choir for so long but like there's still even to this day as you know there's billions of people out there that still have never been uh touched by beatboxing or these sounds that are being created even on a like a, a, a real basic level so it's it's what lane you choose to go down but, but at the end of the day you know if someone got to do it and it was me i was like, i'll have a go at doing that that's wicked you but know? the ball's are on you, you man to be able to just like go for that when like i don't know for me i never wanted to be a musician because i was like well that's no life to be an artist to do to make this ephemeral sort of nothingness that that people can listen to or watch and then it goes away for mm. years i was like, i'm not doing that i'm gonna get a proper job and then beatbox started to pay and i was like oh maybe i can <laughs> become a fucking musician by doing beatbox and then off the back of that i can get work doing so now like i have a really diversified bunch of income streams which come from sort of voiceover work and commercial composition and also live work and now patreon and things like that but like yeah 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 i'm fine with that because that's kind of always where i wanted to be like i was always yeah, yeah. kind of aware that like if you end up really hitting the mark like you hit your optimum level of creativity and it hits the zeitgeist you really can't maintain that for very long nobody can no you can't like no you even can't. like the biggest bands in the world there's very few that have um, that had have had have had a, like a perfect run. Maybe the Rolling Stones, and that's yeah. it. And that's it. Like there, there's yeah. no, you know. So I, I was always like, okay, I'll have a little moment in the fucking in the light, and then I'll just use that to be a sort of reputation thing to get myself work in the creative industries because that'll be a little leg up. That's kind mm. of the only thing I ever wanted to do is I, I just mm. wanted to be. Like the kind of people that that were my kind of the people like people I wanted to be were like weird weird artists making strange music and um people yeah. that worked in the creative industries where they'd get a brief and they'd fulfill it like it was ne mm. I was never like i wanna be fucking Ed Sheeran or fucking one of these things because I was Gallagher always, or something yeah. yeah like i never i never wanted to be that so like I don't know, yeah, when you talk about that winding path and stuff like that like. I, yeah, I feel like if you think you know what your path is when you start out, um, you will quickly find out that <laughs> the path you'll end up on could be yeah. one that you didn't even know was there. You'll end up in a, in a neighboring forest and you'll be like, oh, I like it here better. I never thought this would be a thing. You know, you, just have, you have to have backup plans. So Will Rankin, uh, high ranking. Yeah, hold tight high ranking all hold day. Hold tight high ranking. He fucking, um, I was chatting to him the other day. I had no idea. Um, he's been making absolutely fucking amazing, often comedic bangers for years. He now has a like hipster coffee brand, which is branded with like rave flyer aesthetic and like has ridiculous like rave flyer what? inspired names. He's a creative person. So like at some points you'll be turning your creative fire to doing some or other <clears throat> musical gambit that happens to be your, your shit at that point. You can turn that to anything. So like, yeah, yeah. you know, you're never restricted by, uh, by one thing. Like if you have one dream that you doggedly pursue, okay. But like, mm. you really don't have to. Yeah, you, you can just diversify. Don't, yeah, true. You know? Yeah. And it's, and it's wonderful that there are all these ways to express yourself and make shit and make yourself, keep yourself like creatively satisfied and do shit that resonates with people that affects people. Like it's, it's a world it's now where say that. everyone's yeah. a creator. Everyone, everyone creates shit. It's whether your shit is dope and whether it gets seen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's crossed my mind more recently that, you know, Jack of trades, master of none, that does not apply at all in the slightest. As that in itself is revolutionary. Like sometimes of course you see companies you know for instance editing e editing companies or camera operating companies and i'm often blown away by like their expertise and their knowledge and stuff but um but, but, but 
at the same time, I'd rather know the shortcuts to that make the best that works for my pro- my product or my thing. And that in a similar light to maybe music production, same as in um, animation or, you know, or, or whatever. You know what I mean? Like you just, you put you dip your foot in the pond and you get what you need out of it. Well, That's you can learn theory. to like, yeah, like these days you can learn any skill you need uh, by watching YouTube videos and maybe buying like a fairly cheap course online. And if it's something in the creative industries, mm-hmm. especially, you really can learn that. And the only thing that's going to stop you from learning those skills is whether or not you genuinely believe you have the aptitude for it and whether or mm. not you have the time to put in. Because if, you, if the passion is there, you'll fucking do it. Like, yeah. um, like yeah. the other, the, you know, a while back, about a year ago, I decided that I was going to learn to fucking draw properly. And I did, and I ended up doing these like really good photorealistic portraits and stuff like that. Um, but it's because I put the fucking hours in that I was able to do it. And like, mm. I just always believed that I could if I was given the right training. So I watched YouTube video after YouTube video, going into detail about how to draw each different body parts, shading, lighting, all this kind of stuff. That you can fucking do anything. Do you know what I mean? Like, you can do anything. You can do whatever the fuck shit. you want. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's a beautiful world where, you know, gone are the days you'd yeah. have to spend a lot of money to get an education in a particular thing. But kids today they know, know that. They, they know, know that. Shit. Yeah, that's the thing. They it's know good. Because it. otherwise you're going to get yourself yeah. to hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt if you're in America, tens of thousands of pounds worth of debt if you live here. Mm. And, you know, that's not going to let up anytime soon. You know, these no. dark capitalist forces that just want to put a price on everything or not going to be giving you free education anytime soon. So I think the universities are this kind of old defunct model now where actually you can just educate totally. yourself you can just you can get your own news from wherever you want which has its downsides but you can get your fucking <laughs> skills from wherever you want you just have to fucking put the yeah. time in and you can fucking learn whatever the fuck you want biddy fucking don what a pleasure it has been <laughs> it's been a long time coming As next time hopefully <laughs> yeah. we'll do it in real time in the flesh yeah. you know what I think this has made so much more sense this way you know just having that time in the studio this is exactly how it would have gone down in the studio for those of on the outside looking in without question it's been beautiful I've loved it thanks for yeah. for taking the time man and mate all praise to the originator of the beatbox genre as we currently know it get in get my to know brother. Killer Keller <laughs> thank you my brother and listen all hail the Don Dada from mouth to technica the Don Dada the beady man Legendary. You shall Legendary know levels. my pain. <laughs> yeah. Layers. <laughs> my brother, thank you so much. Stay lucky. Kill a kind of podcast striking again with a vengeance. <laughs> Legend that is beardy man. Hold tight. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>